Hello, and welcome to the launch webinar for the DTU Global Wind Atlas, presented by the International Renewable Energy Agency and the Technical University of Denmark. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Kristen Deason, and I am a program officer with IRENA. It is my great pleasure to welcome you to today's webinar. Before we start our program, I would like to go over some technical information. For today's webinar, we have two options for listening in. You may connect by computer by selecting mic and speakers, or by phone by selecting the telephone option in the right-hand panel. If you should face any technical difficulties during the webinar, please contact the GoToWebinar help desk at the number provided on your screen. I would like to encourage everyone to participate in today's session by asking questions. To do so, simply select the questions panel in the right-hand bar and enter your question with a note of who you would like the question directed to. We will be collecting questions throughout the webinar. If you would like to watch this webinar again or share it with a friend, we will have a full recording available on the IRENA website as well as on the IRENA YouTube channel. Today's webinar will provide background information on the DTU Global Wind Atlas, launched today in the IRENA Global Atlas for Renewable Energy. We will also be having a discussion on the importance and impact of the tool in breaking down barriers to renewable energy development and accelerating worldwide growth of wind power. We will begin with an introduction and overview of the Global Wind Atlas, followed by statements from each member of our speaker panel. Today's speakers include Adnan Amin, Director General of IRENA, Christian van Marschakerveld from the Danish Energy Agency, Kenneth Thompson, Innovation Manager at DTU Wind Energy, and Steve Sawyer, Secretary General of the Global Wind Energy Council. We will then conclude with a short question and answer session. For those of you not familiar with IRENA, we are the intergovernmental agency mandated by countries around the world to promote the widespread and sustainable use of all forms of renewable energy. IRENA currently has 143 members and 30 states in the process of becoming members. In January 2013, IRENA launched the Global Atlas for Renewable Energy. This program was an outcome of the Clean Energy Ministerial process and is aimed at supporting those countries that lack access to the necessary data and expertise to evaluate and develop their renewable energy potential. The initiative provides a freely available online platform that uses a map-based interface to provide global data on solar, wind, geothermal, bioenergy, and ocean energy resources. Currently, 67 countries and more than 50 institutes and partners are contributing to the initiative and the interface provides access to over 1,500 data sets that can help with renewable energy planning. Today, IRENA and the Technical University of Denmark, or DTU, are launching the Global Wind Atlas, which is now the world's most detailed, freely available set of wind resource data. The Global Wind Atlas comprises two components, a data set of modeled global wind speeds at a resolution of one kilometer, and secondly, a set of tools that allow you to directly download wind speed data or view statistics such as wind roses and wind speed histograms. The maps are viewable within the Global Atlas online platform or on smartphones with the Global Atlas Pocket app. The tools allow you to select any area on the map using the Global Atlas online platform and generate wind statistics for that specific area. The Global Wind Atlas dataset and tools were developed by the Technical University of Denmark. The Global Wind Atlas is a contribution of Denmark through DTU to the work of the Clean Energy Ministerial and materializes achievement of the goals set by the CEM's multilateral solar and wind working group led by Denmark, Germany, and Spain. According to the IRENA data quality classification, the DTU Global Wind Atlas is recommended for use for education, policy making, and analysis of potentials. In this data classification category, Data can be used for identification of opportunity areas, as well as for further investigation of renewable energy potentials. This data is not recommended for financial decision making, but rather is intended to help countries understand where their resources lie so that they can plan accordingly and help companies prospect emerging wind markets. 
Now let's move to our speaker presentations to get a sense of the impact of the Global Wind Atlas. While our panelists are speaking, we will be showing a slideshow of screenshots from the Global Wind Atlas to showcase the capabilities of this powerful new tool. Our first speaker is Adnan Amin, the Director General of IRENA. Thank you very much, Kristen, and uh, it's uh, really a pleasure uh, to be on this webinar to launch this very important tool. Um, we're living uh, at a time of transformation in global energy systems, which is very exciting. The role of renewable energy within this transformation is front and center. Uh, with the discussion on the global climate change issues today, renewable energy has achieved more and more uh, prominence. But it's also at a, coming at a time of declining cost and an improving business case for renewables that makes it an optimal economic choice. So it's great potential and great opportunities ahead of us. But one of the problems with deployment has always been measuring how we do it. How does the potential match in terms of the business case? We know that the potential globally is vast, but the upfront cost of measuring potential, determining the best locations for projects, which are geographically very specific, are obstacles in many countries which have limited data. But the technical difficulties of estimating resources can lead really to underestimations of true potential and increased perceived risks for project development, which acts as a disincentive. In response to this need for information uh, for uh, projects, IRENA created in 2013 the Global Atlas. It's now one of the most advanced tools of its kind, combining maps from 67 governments and more than 50 data centers to provide reliable information on renewable energy resources anywhere in the world, from major cities to isolated islands to remote deserts. The online geographical information system, GIS, and the mobile app, the Global Atlas Pocket, provide free access to over 1,500 data sets that contain solar, wind, geothermal, biomass, and marine energy potential for locations around the world. Online simulation tools allow for processing of this information and assessment of renewable energy potential. And I'd like to underline the fact that this is a free resource for the first time information that is so germane to the business case of projects is being made available in the marketplace without charge. Today, we're introducing the newest addition to the Global Atlas dataset with the Global Wind Atlas, which has been developed by the Technical University of Denmark, DTU. The Global Wind Atlas was initiated in the framework of the Clean Energy Ministerial's Multilateral Solar and Wind Working Group to help increase the global share of renewable energy by providing the world with detailed and validated wind potential through an online platform. The Clean Energy Ministerial started this activity around the same time that IRENA was being created, and it has become one of our flagship activities with the strong support of the CEM and in particular with the governments of Spain, Germany, and Denmark. The Global Wind Atlas is the most detailed and accurate wind atlas available without cost in the public domain. It provides wind resource data so detailed that it can be used for pre-feasibility studies. Prior to this release, wind data was only publicly available at 10 kilometer resolution or poorer, which resulted in underestimations of the true wind potential increased risk, and increased costs for wind energy planners. The data set also uses micro-scale modeling to capture wind speed variability on small scales. And thus, we have in the public domain, without charge, a resource that can dramatically lower the cost of project development and implementation in the future. The Wind Atlas provides visual maps showing wind speeds at three different heights and tools to generate and export data and statistics such as wind roses and wind speed distributions over a chosen area. It can also be freely accessed online, reducing the need for a costly on-the-ground assessment of potential and optimal location for projects. Moreover, for the first time, the Global Atlas will allow users to directly download the data from the Global Wind Atlas. This will make the Atlas an invaluable resource for energy modelers and planners around the world. The Wind Atlas brings clarity on the location of the best wind resources 
at a resolution we have not had before. The data can be used in zoning, planning, and target setting, and allows countries to manage resources more effectively. Zoning is a valuable method of creating para parameters to examine potential scenarios for renewable deployment, and together with other methods of scenario analysis, is supported by the Global Wind uh, Atlas. Reliable renewable energy potential data can allow national and regional decision makers to tailor scenario analyses to their preferred perceived pathway for renewable energy development. The new Global Wind Atlas provides this needed data directly and for free, making it a groundbreaking tool to help jumpstart wind energy development worldwide. We've seen already in recent years the cost of wind energy development coming down that wind power generation is now more and more uh, markets around the world cost competitive on the grid and in some places among the cheapest sources of generation. And we believe that this will be a new impetus to investment in future wind uh, uh, power generation. For the first time, the public wind data set provides relevant information on islands. With this addition, the IRENA Global Atlas will support the IRENA facilitated partnerships such as the SID Island Lighthouses Initiative, which brings together islands from around the world for development of their renewable energy potential, and which will be featured at the coming Paris COP meeting. In addition, as part of the creation of regional energy corridors, such as the African Clean Energy Corridor that ARENA is also facilitating, data, data sets and consortia can help to inform the delivery of high-level continental and regional zoning and smaller scale local resource mapping studies. These are crucial steps for the corridors to create enabling environments, environments for regional markets, trade power, and attract high levels of renewable energy investment. With the impetus that renewable energy is enjoying in the African setting, we recently launched an African REMAP report that looked at the quadrupling of investment in renewables by 2030 and much of this will be utilizing the rich wind resources that exist in this region. I want to express my sincere thanks to DTU, the Danish Technical University, and the government for Denmark for this achievement. The decades of experience gained in wind mapping at the Technical University of Denmark have provided a strong basis for the research that has gone into creating this wind atlas and we're very grateful for this tremendous achievement and for the generosity of sharing it with the international community through the IRENA platform. The collaboration really highlights DTU's dedication to improving society through natural and technical scientific research and its key role in increase, increasing the global transition to renewable energy, as well as the commitment of the government of Denmark not only to move towards a clean energy system domestically or to support international action. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Amin. I would now like to introduce our second speaker, Christian van Marschakoverd, who is the head of division, Center for Global Cooperation at the Danish Energy Agency. Christian? Thank you, Christine, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to participate in this Wind Atlas release. It's very much appreciated. Denmark has the goal to become a fossil-free nation in 2050, and we have adopted several action plans for this green transition. Wind energy plays a key role in this transition, and today 40% of all our electricity is produced at our wind turbines, both onshore and offshore, and this percentage will increase further. We have started the introduction of wind turbines decades ago, and since then, Denmark has spearheaded the development of cheap, reliable, and clean wind power. And today, cost-effective development of wind power is already competitive to fossil fuel-based power production. This is, of course, due to better, bigger, and more advanced turbines. At Danish testing facilities, we today see six to eight megawatt turbines in operation. But in order for wind to be competitive, there are some essential requirements that goes beyond the turbines including successful grid integration and good systems for operation and maintenance of wind turbines and wind farms. And last but not least, 
good siding of the turbines in areas with good and stable wind resources. The Atlas being launched here today is a strong tool for policymakers to point out the best areas for new wind projects globally, and therefore also a strong planning tool that will lead to optimized performance of future projects, lower risks, and thus also to ensure sound economy of the future wind projects. We have had a good cooperation with the wind unit at Denmark's Technical University, and they have assisted us in wind modeling methods for many years in Denmark, but also in other European countries and many other countries around the world. DTU's methodology is also the basis for this new wind atlas. We are very proud to have supported this work, and we regard it as a strong contribution to enhance use of wind energy around the world. Back in 2010, major economies forum discussed the need for increased use of renewable energy sources and increased energy efficiency. This resulted in the establishment of the Clean Energy Ministerial, and Denmark, Germany, and Spain accepted to take the lead of the wind and solar working group under this framework. This working group and the partner IRENA took the first discuss discussions on a vision for a global wind atlas, and the group shared the vision with the energy ministers who supported this idea. Today, four years later, we have delivered on the minister's joint vision, and we see the result, a new global atlas which we can be proud of. It is my sincere hope that the new wind atlas will be used by many energy planners around the world, and also that it will push energy administrators to set up good plans for the development of wind energy. Denmark has a close cooperation with countries like South Africa, Mexico, China, Indonesia, and Turkey, and others, on the introduction of renewable energy, and especially wind power. Specific and accurate wind atlases are useful tools for these countries' efforts to develop cost-effective wind projects. It is very fitting that IRENA have integrated the wind atlas into their global renewable energy atlas. We believe this is the right way to go, and that this will be a very useful tool for the global green transition. Let me finish by congratulating both IRENA and DTU for a successful work and a very good result on this wind atlas. Thank you very much. Thank you, Christian. Our next speaker is Kenneth Thompson. Mr. Thompson is the Innovative Manager for DTU Wind Energy. Thank you, Christian. I'd like to start out with uh, saying thank you to the previous speakers for the uh, nice presentations and also for the nice words for DTU Wind Energy. Um, I'd like to start my uh, brief presentation with a parallel story of the Global Wind Atlas and the European Wind Atlas. When the European Wind Atlas uh, came, that was in a period where personal computers became more popular and where data storage uh, developed very fast with uh, CDs and, and other medias, and also where European collaboration uh, developed quite fastly. And um, a number of similarities appeared at the time of the outset of the Global Wind Atlas. Those were the fast internet uh, access, uh, also a massive open global data sets uh, describing the Earth's atmosphere, but also uh, the surface conditions, and on top of that, a very strong international collaboration uh, in a global uh, sense. That, together with an urgent need to mitigate climate change uh, by uh, utilizing sensible renewable energy decisions, uh, has set the scene for the development of the Global Wind Atlas. As also mentioned by some of the previous speakers, the background for this uh, Global Wind Atlas was the framework of the Clean Energy Ministerials, and uh, in particular, uh, the Working Group on Solar and Wind Technologies, which was uh, led by Germany, Spain, and Denmark. Another important factor was the uh, Danish Energy Agency's uh, development program, uh, Energy Development and Demonstration Program, that funded the Global Wind Atlas projects as uh, Denmark's contribution to the working group objectives. In the project partnership, we have uh, both old and new partners. Some of the partners uh, DTU Wind and Energy uh, has uh, worked together with for many years, and other partners are new and we have not worked with them uh, before. 
examples are Arena and also the uh, Master Institute. We look forward to the continued collaboration in the future um, and are sure that these partners can, can uh, participate in uh, creating a much greater impact of the Atlas and also bring members of uh, different energy sector communities together in a dialogue about what is needed. Let's look uh, a little detail into what's in the Global Wind Atlas. It's made up of uh, a predicted wind climate in a fine mess over the entire world. And for those who know the WASP uh, method, this modeling method is uh, similar with the uh, method behind the Global Wind Atlas. And what makes it reality, it's, uh, what makes the Global Wind Atlas a reality today, that's uh, primarily recent developments in uh, atmospheric data sets and also in uh, topographical data sets. The methodologies are distributed openly and also are the input data, the flow modeling effects and also the results. And the results have been compared against uh, other wind atlases that DG Wind Energy has uh, made before. And um, that includes uh, sophisticated methods like satellite remote sensing for uh, coastal regions. The most exciting things with the Global Wind Atlas is that the data reveals uh, resources that may not have known, uh, been known before and the uh, high resolution mapping brings out hills and ridges and uh, on top of that then favor favorable uh, sites emerge for the uh, planning phases. I would like to uh, acknowledge the hard work of all the experts in the project team and uh, conclude my talk here by stating that we look forward to the next step which would be to use the Global Wind Atlas for establishing priorities for more detailed uh, national wind atlases, including uh, measurements. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. Next, I will introduce our final speaker, Mr. Steve Sawyer, Secretary General of the Global Wind Energy Council. Steve? Yeah, good afternoon, or good morning or evening, depending on where you are. Um, thanks to Irene and DTU for giving me the opportunity to uh, speak on behalf of the private sector in this, uh, in this launch. I'll just start by saying that data is, of course, a very sensitive issue uh, for us because it is the sine qua non without which uh, wind development is possible and because once it gets down to a certain resolution, it becomes commercial and has proprietary data. But uh, we welcome this effort. Um, because it is outside the commercial domain, but believe it's of sufficient quality to be useful nonetheless. Particularly useful as a tool for governments and policymakers, as Adnan mentioned at the top of the session, uh, for things like zoning, uh, but also for detailed planning for energy development, planning for for uh, grid expansion and the other uh, associated. Uh, things of either building a new energy system or transforming uh, an existing system into one more reliant upon renewables. I mean, historically, wind atlases um, have tended to underestimate um, the uh, available resources, which is understand in giving the methodology, although with some ex exceptions where they uh, overestimated it. Uh, I remember the old UNEP uh, SWERA project actually was the means by which the excellent wind resources in northern Kenya were discovered because the conventional wisdom up till that time was that in equatorial Africa there wasn't much wind, much of any commercially exploitable wind, but uh, that turned out not to be true and it also turned out, it turns out that with newer technology the areas which are commercially exploitable are much, much larger than we'd previously thought. I think the, the Atlas can also be uh, a useful tool for not so much the big companies which will already have this data and more besides and will collect their own data, but for local entrepreneurs getting into the business perhaps for the first time or moving into new territory for the first time and it will give them a good guide as to where they should be uh, prospecting. Because as although uh, we know that the global potentials are huge, far beyond what we could ever need, but for an individual project, the only thing that matters at the end of the day is what the wind is like here, on this spot. Um, 
and while before investing people will do their own very specific site messages all extra data particularly if it's over a long time series helps to verify or lead you to question what you get from your year or two of met mass measurements uh, taken at a specific site because if there's one thing we've learned about resource assessment over the years it's the more data over a longer number of years over a longer period and from a uh, ground truth by uh, surrounding measurements as much as possible, the more accurate is likely to be. Um, and while this data is not bankable in the sense that you couldn't take it to uh, take it to the bank and finance your project, it can be used to support your own resource assessment and provide more uh, confidence uh, in the number that you ultimately put down when you say, I want you to loan me $20 million to build this project and I think this much energy is going to come out the other side. That's where the, where the developer really takes the risks and the more they can do to reduce the uncertainty both for their own minds but also in the financial institutions that are lending them the money to do it, the better off we'll be. Um, I, again, would just like to close by thanking IRENA and DTU for this event and for this work which is excellent and an increasing number of scenarios uh, that have come out globally over the course of the last two or three years project a, an electricity mix uh, by 2050 that's somewhere between 30 or 35 percent wind energy globally. And I think this atlas is an important tool that can help us get there quickly uh, and increase the economic benefits associated with a shift away from fossil fuels and towards a sustainable energy future. Thank you very much. Thank you, Steve. Again, I would like to extend a gracious thank you to our four panelists for offering their perspectives on the Global Wind Atlas. We will now move on to the question and answer session of our program. Thank you to those who have already submitted questions. And as a reminder, if you would like to submit a question for one of our panelists, simply select the questions panel in the right-hand bar and enter your question. Our first question I'm going to direct to Jake Badger, who actually wasn't one of our panelists, but is here uh, on call to answer questions. Uh, Jake is a senior researcher at DTU Wind Energy and was the principal developer of the data in the Global Wind Atlas. So Jake, the first question is, what is the spatial resolution of the Global Wind Atlas? Okay, hello. This is Jake Badger. I hope you can hear me okay. Yes, so the question is about the spatial resolution. So we have different uh, ways of expressing that. Um, a calculation for the Global Wind Atlas is made every 250 meters. So every 250 meters um, around the globe there's a calculation of the predicted wind climate. Then you actually have to think about what was the data that was used to go into that calculation. For the elevation the data was 150 meter resolution and for the roughness information about the, the kind of surface you're making a wind prediction over, it's every 300 meters, uh, the grid size. So, so the answer is kind of a bit more nuanced, that um, the calculations are made every 250 meters, um, but the actual surface description depends on, on whether it's elevation or roughness. I hope that answers the question. Thanks, Jake. Actually, the second question is coming your direction as well. This question is, over what time period does the data underlying the wind atlas cover? Is this long enough to account for interannual variab variability in the wind resource? Jake, can you take that one? Yes. Okay, that's another excellent question. So we use reanalysis as the basis for our um, description of the wind climate. So the reanalysis data sets are uh, multi-decadal. So we actually have... Um, um, yeah, many years of data that's gone into that uh, calculation of wind climate. So if we, for example, take the MIRA data set, I believe it starts in 1979 to around, uh, it goes up to present day, but I think we cut it off at 2013. So we have um, around 30 years of data going into creating our climatology. Okay, thank you. Our next question. I'm going to direct to my colleague Nicolas Fichot, who is also on the line. Uh, Nicolas is the program officer for Knowledge at IRENA and is the program manager for the Global Atlas for Renewable Energy. So Nicolas, the question is, 
specifically, what features of the atlas are most useful for businesses in their planning and development processes? Uh, thank you, Christine, and thank you for the question. Uh, so the, this is a very particular uh, integration we are doing today. It, it is the first time that we both include uh, a map uh, and a set of maps at, at that resolution. One kilometer is, is very high. And also it is the first time that we also connect our global atlas to a tool that is hosted in DTU. And the why we did that and we decided to make this uh, investment is that uh, the map at one kilometer in our viewer can use the functionalities that we had developed previously. And for example, these functionalities that you can extract the highest wind speed values directly by changing the color scheme on the map, which is something that is, is not very common functionality. You can also connect to the catalog of all the data sets that we also have uh, collected in the past. And for example, in this catalog of data sets, we have infrastructure, so grids, at global level. And also for some countries, we have very detailed grids, which are coming from, uh, from the National Renewable Energy Laboratory from the US, and they contributed 400 countries, uh, sorry, 400 uh, maps with 20 countries for grids uh, that can be very helpful in your prospection uh, process. As, as for the tool, uh, this is the first time that we uh, enable downloading data. So the, the advantage is that with the Global Atlas, what you can do is that you can have the high wind speed, you can add the infrastructure, you can see the roads, you can see the population center, it's, it's all available there. You can zoom in and, and zero in an area that looks interesting at, at mesoscale. You, can, you cannot use this data for very detailed assessment, but at mesoscale. And then you can launch the tool that allows you to draw a polygon, see what is the wind statistic, download this wind statistic so that you can use the wind statistic into your own uh, model. And th this is really the first time we do that, this full integration from the, the map perspective to the zoning perspective down to providing the numbers. This is really the first time we do that in this, this global atlas. Okay, thank you, Nicola. Uh, next question is, which organizations have provided the data? And Nicola, I think we'll look to you to answer that one as well. All right, uh, so for the wind part, we consider that DTU is the data provider, and I know that, that Jake has used mesoscale model from other, uh, other organizations. In the map that we published, you will find uh, the grids, the grids, uh, at global level are coming from OpenStreetMap and uh, we purchase an extract of OpenStreetMap. So the, the grids that you will, uh, you will find there are uh, in some countries quite well documented, in some countries they are slightly incomplete. So in case you see gaps in the grids, for example, please come to us. The, the roads, we have integrated all the roads at global level uh, so that you can see the distance from the road and it's very interesting because if you find a very hot spot, but it, if it's an area that is impossible to access, you can you can already partly discard it, except if you are ready to build the road, uh, which can happen. Um, well, in that case, the roads are coming from a, a, a data set that is uh, collected in the Netherlands, and we connect it to that. Some of the grids are coming from uh, NREL in the United States. The protected areas are coming from UNEP, uh, and they have the, the best database we know of at global level for protected areas. You will find also the topography that is coming from uh, Geomodel and the uh, land cover that is a bit old. Uh, we are trying to find an update and the land cover is from the European Space Agency. Okay, great. Thank you. The next question is what measured data were used? And Jake, can you answer that one for us? Yes, okay. So actually I wanted to um, uh, have an opportunity actually to, to supplement uh, Nicholas' answer there about the data sources. Um, but I should, I should mention that the, the first answer to that uh, question about the measurement is actually the measurements are not actually taken into our modeling system at all. So you can think of any measurement is a way to verify the data. But to, to qualify that a bit more, measurements are going into the, the reanalysis data. So reanalysis data is a description of the global state of the atmosphere. And th that I would like to have this uh, chance to say that the sources of the atmospheric data are um, we're getting it from um, NOAA, from the USA. We're getting it from NCAR, which is a, a research center in the USA. We're getting it from NASA, 
and we're getting it from the ECMWF. So these are the big uh, sort of meteorological institutes that are providing this kind of data set. Um, so rather than using measurements and, and trying to assimilate them um, ourselves, we let the reanalysis um, providers do that for us. So um, that means we kind of um, we have to treat this data in the right way. That's why we have to add all of the microscale modeling elements that we do within this methodology. Um, and I'd also say that the, uh, for our wind modeling, we also need information about the, uh, the terrain. And we use um, the ESA uh, globe cover data to give us information about land use. And we use a, um, a, a, data, set called, a data set called Viewfinder for the elevation which is, uh, a lot of that is based on the SRTM data um, from, from NASA. Thank you. Great, thank you, Jake. Uh, we're gonna go back to Nicola for our next question, which is, how is this map different from other existing wind maps? All right, uh, in the, when you, it's, it's a very fair question, because when you come to our Global Atlas, you see uh, several data sources and several providers for uh, wind maps. So the, some of the major providers that we have are, uh, so now DTU, and also there is a CNR from Spain, there is a NREL, and there is also one uh, wind map that we, have, we promoted a lot, which was a, 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 a contribution from, from a private company called Fritier, and now I, I think it's called Vaisala. And it was the first time that uh, we were putting in the public domain a uh, wind map that was uh, five kilometer resolution. Uh, and it, it was already a breakthrough. It was uh, two years ago. And uh, through this uh, partnership with Pretty, we were able to really push the boundaries of what is available in, for free in the public domain. Uh, with, with this map, what we could do is to provide the average uh, wind speed. And the, I mean, the map was uh, so extensively uh, validated. Though, in that case, the, the, the best uh, granularity you could get was 5 kilometer resolution. And uh, if you would compare the, the map visually, you, you may not compare them value per value because it, it does not really make sense, but the, you can compare them visually. And, and look at the patterns, for example. You will see that the, the analysis that was done by DTU is adding a lot to uh, the, the, the level of analysis you can do since you can really identify within a five kilometer pixel so many different features and you're able really to see the impact of, uh, of, the, of the, the landscape on the, on the, the wind resource. Uh, in the case of DTU, they even went to uh, downscale to 250 meters, the whole globe, which is absolutely uh, incredible. When the first time I heard that, I was really surprised. And then they re-aggregated at uh, one kilometer. And what they did is that they also provided a map that is showing the disparity within one pixel, which is extremely interesting if you are looking at, uh, if you are trying to quantify a little bit uh, viability or uncertainty, because within one pixel, within one kilometer, you will have 16 small pixels of 250 meters. And they are telling you, well, in this one kilometer, we, we can have a great viability. So uh, be careful on what is happening there. There is a high complexity. And it's sending, I think, a good message uh, regarding uh, the, you know, being careful with the data always and, and tr trying to understand as best as possible what, what is provided there. We, the, the challenge we have is that we are releasing this data set, which is usually the kind of data you find for experts, and we are giving it available to the grand public. So we had really to make an effort for educating the user. It's, it's, it's not something easy to use, to understand, and to be familiar with. So we are, I hope we did a good job. And I, I hope you can make the best of the, the tool that we are providing. Great, thank you. Our next question comes from one of our listeners, I believe, in India. The question is, can I get the Wind Atlas for India? Nicola, can you answer that one? Uh, good news, yes. Uh, good news, yes. You, you can, what you can do is, uh, when, when you open this map, you, you find a global view. However, the, the tool is not uh, really designed to, to stay at that level. So what you can do is first to either type a location in the search bar on the top, like you would, you, you would do on Google Maps, for example. Just type a location. Or you can zoom in, or you can, uh, uh, you can, uh, you can draw a rectangle and zoom in, like you would do on, a, on, on Google, uh, Google Maps, for example. What you do is that you identify your location. And then, if you want to uh, save what you did, you just uh, log in. You create a login and password very quickly. And you can save the view, so that in the future you can come back and you are able to 
use exactly the same map that you have created. So in case you zoom in on India and uh, you want to remove some of the layers that we have created, you want to add some of the layers from the catalog or even add your own layers, you can do that with the Global Atlas. And this is something we will show in the technical webinar that will take place uh, first week of November, it's the fourth? Uh, the third. On the third. And on the third you will be able to see all the detailed functionality. Okay, great. Well, that's the last question we uh, received here. So if anyone has another question, please submit it right away. We'll wait a couple of seconds to see if we get any more. Okay. All right, we have a question for Jake about the data uncertainty, and the question is, is the data uncertainty communicated uh, in the data set? What's the last part of the question? Is it communicated? Is it communicated? Yeah, can you get information yeah. on data uncertainty? Yeah, that's, um, well, that is a very, very good question, and I hope we do so. So, um, in the in the way we present the data, we, we have uh, maps presented by ARENA from the Global Atlas on Renewable Energy. And then we have another uh, data set or another way, a portal to get the data, which is a DTU own um, website. And we're from that place, you can see a lot more details of the modeling. And the one thing I would recommend everyone to do if they're looking at a site and, and kind of getting serious about how, how should they use this data is what Nicola said about um, giving this data out to a wider public. Um, is an understanding of the uncertainty, is to um, look at the, the ruggedness index, because we know in those areas the uncertainty is, is higher than in, in places where there isn't uh, complex terrain. So I, what I'm hope, I mean, I think we're, we're saying what is the appropriate use of this data. Uh, we've heard it several times during the, the webinar today. It's a, it's a planning tool, it's not for citing, um, and so that is the way we communicate the, the appropriate use of this. If you want to get into more depth about the sort of quantifying the uncertainty, then you, sh you should come to the DTU uh, web pages and you can find out about the modeling limitations and, and, and get a, an estimate of the uncertainty. We have a, a chapter on the validation um, where we, we took the Global Wind Atlas results and compared to uh, wind atlases and, and SAR, the synthetic aperture radar, retrieved winds in 10 countries. Um, distributed around the world. Um, so I'd say that we have, we have made an effort to, to uh, sort of quantify a, a, the uncertainty, but I think also it is something we can, we can do um, more in the, in the future as well. So the warning is in the uh, appropriate use, and I think we've made that quite clear um, from the beginning. Great. Thank you, Jake. Uh, next question is a, a forward-looking one. How will the Global Wind Atlas evolve over time? Nicola, can you address that? Uh, yes, it, it has to do also with the, the growth of the global atlas of, of ARENA itself. Uh, so what, what you see here is a, is a first release of, of the global wind atlas and, and a connection to a tool that, is, that allows to display to chart and to extract the, the statistics. It's already, I think, a, a, a huge progress compared to the situation where we started the whole thing and, and where all these things were, were not available at at that level and, and not so easily on the web, clearly. Um, what uh, will happen in the next month within ARENA, we, we are trying to have uh, some more analysis linked to uh, wind energy. And we think that not only it's interesting to have information on the, on the wind speed, but for policymakers or for decision makers, it's, it's very abstract for the moment. And what we want to do with these kind of platforms is is to provide an, an ID on when you have a wind speed or when you have a situation or location, how, how does it translate into progressing on your energy mix? And therefore, what we will seek to do is to try to have a sort of wind prospector, so being able to translate data similar to the, the one of the Global Wind Atlas, uh, to be able to, to, to translate that into energy equivalent, into cost equivalent. So we will try to to provide some guidance in, the, in that direction with probably a very large error range, but at least to get closer to the policy makers because that's what they are, they are facing on a day-to-day -day basis. As users also, we discovered that we have many, many people and uh, small private companies like, like uh, let's see what's saying, 
that are using this atlas for prospecting new markets. And then we thought that it would be a good idea that this data would be uh, more broadly available. And that's why uh, uh, end of last year did we, we published all the data that we have into a, a pocket app. So what happens is, is when you go to your app store, you look for Global Atlas, you are able to find an app that will want to work on your phone. And, and basically I did that because uh, when I was in Namibia, I was in a spot and, and quite quite far from the from, from my computer. And what happened is that I saw these trees that were burnt in the middle of nowhere and I, I, I thought it, it must be a fantastic wind spot. Uh, however, I had no tool to uh, be able to, to assess that and, uh, and that, that's where I got this idea to create a, a mobile app. So now when you're on the move or you are with your colleagues or you are discussing with your banker, you can you know, pull the app and if you have a discussion about a location, you can at least have a look at what is happening there. And you can illustrate and, and back up the point that you are making. Of course, you can't take a decision, but you are able to, to back up quite well and to illustrate what you are saying about the location. And, and we think that is very important because it's never when you are in front of your computer with the Global Atlas open that your boss will just jump in and ask you about uh, the next hotspot. It, it's, not, it's never like that. What we want to do also, we have another uh, user community that is approaching us more and more. It's the modeling, energy modeling community. And for the time being, I must say our Global Atlas was quite close. You could not download the data. Uh, and we did that because we had to be very secure on intellectual property, and it's still the case. However, in the uh, geospatial community and with the standards we are using, we think it's possible for some of the data sets, when we have the intellectual property rights and the copyrights in place, we could be able to give access to downloading some of the data. And that would be a huge uh, opening of this global atlas. We can become a place where you can have your energy model and you could have a plugin, for example, where you link that to directly the data sets that are available, not only to the geospatial interface. We are still doing training because also we discovered that the policymakers we are talking about and the policymakers that are supposed to use this kind of platform don't exist at all. And what we need to do is that we need to bring them closer to understanding what these tools can do for them. Because a policymaker is not a geospatial analyst, it's not somebody that will use measurement data. So we need to show them the capabilities of this kind of tools and how it can help them do their job. And that's why we started this training, uh, this training courses and we had a few sessions this year. We will try to continue doing that and to sort of making this kind of use of tools and data more popular and easier for these policy makers. And finally, something I'd like to mention is we, we have a great partnership with the World Bank, uh, with the SMAP program of the World Bank. They are releasing uh, maps through the Global Atlas. We are sort of publishers for, for, this, for, for the SMAP program for 12 countries. And what will happen is that they, they are also releasing uh, validation measurement data and we will seek to make, make available these measurement data. So you could imagine that in the future you could have a map, you could zoom on a country, you could find infrastructure, you could zero in an area that looks interesting, you could launch a tool in order to see the statistics, then make your simulation with your energy model and maybe there has been a publicly funded measurement campaign near your site as well. And since it's publicly funded, maybe we could give access to this measurement data. So in the best case scenario, this is how far you may be able to go with a, a platform like, like the Atlas. Okay, great. Thanks, Nicolas. Do we have any more questions? Yes, one of the uh, um, participants is asking, uh, since this atlas exists, uh, do we still need uh, to validate uh, locally the wind measurements with wind measurement campaign? I think it's a very important question. My answer is definitely yes, and I will give the floor to Jake also uh, to uh, illustrate what, uh, what I'm saying. Yeah, uh, thank you for the question, and um, yeah, the answer is very important. So the Global Wind Atlas is like an overview, a global overview at very high detail, but there's still a need to, to carry out validated and dedicated modeling uh, work for particular countries or sites. So the Global Wind Atlas can be used to prioritize a place of interest where, where initiatives should be set uh, in place to, to find out more about the wind resource, and that involves certainly measurements and I would say in most cases also a dedicated modeling effort. Um, so yeah, we definitely have uh, 
a need to to validate the data. So the Global Wind Atlas is is a way to um, yeah to, to get an overview, but it's not a replacement for measurements. Okay, thank you, Jake. I think we'll stop there uh, since we're we're nearing about an hour. I'd like to offer another big thank you to our four speakers today, as well as our two uh, question answerers here, and also everyone participating in the webinar today. If we were not able to address all your questions during today's session, please feel free to send an email to potentials at irena.org, and that's also on your slide right now. I also encourage you to register for our upcoming technical webinar on the Global Wind Atlas. This webinar will be hosted by the Clean Energy Solutions Center, on November 3rd and will include a demonstration and a technical discussion of the Global Wind Atlas data set and tools. And you can find the registration link on your screen. I also invite you to connect with us on social media to keep abreast of the latest Global Atlas and IRENA news. Thank you again for your participation and this concludes today's webinar.